Welcome to Extending Beyond Practicing Practice, Identifying Variables That Can Disrupt Routine Design Education. My name is Andrea Wilkinson, and I'm a lecturer across graphic interaction and service design areas at the Lucas School of Arts and Thomas More University in Belgium. As a researcher, I focus specifically on designing for underserved communities, design education, and social design. In 2020, I finished my PhD at the University of Leeds in the UK, looking at student experiences when designing for one. That is what this presentation will be about. Some of the insights that came out of this research, namely variables that design educators can use to disrupt or reflect upon their educational approach, which results in coursework that is challenging, engaging, and leads to enriched student experiences. But first, a little bit about how this research came to be. In 2012, the precursor to this research began as part of a project funded by the former Flemish Digital Research Institute, or iMinds. It was a project that looked to identify how smart objects, or the Internet of Things, could support a person with dementia living at home. The research that my colleague and I did involved working with people with dementia in their homes, as well as carrying out observations and interventions in care facility dementia wards, where we worked together with nurses and care staff. These experiences led to our own position that dementia was a lived experience and that although one could draw similarities across the dementia population, individuals often needed specific support and tools that were particular to their own day-to-day -day experience. Linking academic research to education, we got the opportunity to develop a module for master's students. In the module, this individualized approach was used. Basically, in this module, we worked entirely off campus in a care facility and students began designing for one, working with one individual with dementia and identifying ways in which design might be able to ameliorate this person's life. With continued iterations of the module, there became an increased interest in this designing for one approach and how it was functioning within the design educational program and its impact on the student designers and their way of working. Regardless of their background or discipline, students were not limiting themselves to their own domain, but instead used whatever resources they had at hand to prototype and make things for the participant. Students were highly motivated and engaged. Some visited participants outside of the moments required for school in order to carry out additional tests or as a means to gain insight into other parts of the person's routine or in order to meet family members or other carers. Students spoke of how different the module was to their other modules and how this difference was impacting their way of working and their understanding about research. Equally, those caregivers who were initially skeptical of the students' abilities were often delighted and touched by the things that the students were creating. This called for further investigation into the value of designing for one and how it extended to the students' way of being with the action of designing. It called for analysis into why the students were so engaged and motivated by these experiences, in spite of their being difficult and even confrontational contexts. In terms of theoretical context, where might designing for one place itself as an approach? Was it a model for education or a form of design participation? With a primary focus on experience, this research looked at placing designing for one within the student-centered exploratory framework of problem-based learning. However, unlike PBL's concept of triggers in which students begin with a set of predetermined information that is used as a means to engage and motivate students toward a particular problem, designing for one is relationship based and uses the relationship between student and participant as a situation that offers motivation, engagement, problem definition, and learning. For designing for one to be accepted as a new form of design participation, it can neither be fully placed within participatory design in which a marginalized participant is accepted as a full design partner as a means to empower them, nor as co-design in which a design is created through a collective process. Instead, designing for one requires participation but does not define what this participation must look like or how it will impact the process other than to say that the participation based on relationship between designer and participant by nature influences a designer's choices. In order to explore designing for one further, over the course of two years, four individual student module case studies used the designing for one approach across four design educational disciplines, interaction design, graphic design, advertising, and digital design, both locally and in Belgium and abroad in the U.S., Moving away from dementia as the primary context, the four cases ran across different coursework within bachelor degree dis discipline-specific programs, and each explored a different topic. The first one explored e-inclusion, 
or marginalized communities and the increased shift of local government to communicate digitally. The second one explored supporting neighborhood initiatives and engagement in the multicultural neighborhood. The third project was about supporting people with dementia in a residential care facility. And finally, the last one was about city center revitalization. Documented with photos, observation, and post-module interviews, these four cases were subsequently analyzed by 21 design education experts looking specifically for elements within the designing for one approach used within de design education that defined it against standard design education practice. To identify how these cases were operating differently than traditional design modules, or what Scholl referred to as courses in which students are practicing practice, Designing for One had to be analyzed against existing design curricula. A workshop entitled The Residue of Interaction was held at Decipher, the AIGA Design Education Conference at the University of Michigan Penny Stamp School of Design in the US. Here, 21 international design educators analyzed initial research findings. The workshop utilized a visualization process called mapping in which participants create a workshop artifact while they interact in small groups. The participants involved were recruited for the workshop based on their background, including emeritus design professors at some of the US's top design programs, as well as design educators serving on the AIGI Design Education Committee steering board. Each was a critically engaged design educator and ranged from heads of design departments and thus curricula to well-published international design education academics. The rest of interaction mapping focused on six key areas. The first one focused on a, the workshop participants' own experience of an individual impacting their design practice. Secondly, it identified what a student might take away from the designing for one experience. Thirdly, it determined points of difference between the designing for one approach presented and the modules at the participant's own institution. The fourth thing that they were exploring was looking at potential organizations or people groups that might best utilize the designing for one approach within coursework. Finally, what they were looking at were trying to match the approach to the skills and competencies identified by the AIGA white paper, Designer 2025. Although not explicitly intended within the workshop structure, initial reflection on the workshop dealt with the value of designing for one. One of the primary discussion points was context, how contextual understanding can ground a student designer's confidence to make decisions. While discussing riskiness, participants also related the student's experience to that of their own students. Were their students having the same sort of experiences? Were they coming into contact with similar contexts? Were those insights being generated by some other way? Did this way of working prepare students for the future? One group suggested that it helped prepare students to work with complexity and populations with shifting needs. Another group suggested it prepared students to look at ways to bridge the physical and digital by teaching them to analyze people's needs, wants, values, and patterns. And yet another group thought it broached the subject of a designer's core values by working authentically and by connecting these values to services. Looking at the collated points of difference as one data set, it was not that the student module cases were fundamentally different to other modules the workshop participants and the lead lecturers taught, but there were elements that made them feel radically disparate. Aspects of what were seemingly familiar course modules had been altered or changed for not only the student, but the lecturer as well. As a collection, these points of difference started to reveal how the process of designing for one might be disrupting standard practice. Not surprisingly, participants noted that the hyper-focus working with one user participant was different to many of their course modules that focused on designing for user groups or demographics. For one participant, the participation of an individual meant that it was a very individualized solution for one person and not a group or community like their courses generally focused on. For one of the lectures of the four student module cases, participation of a user meant that student reflections were more considered and the students had had a different sort of an awareness for their project and its design. Finally, some educators discussed it in terms of authenticity and its being real person to person versus how it was in their own classes in which students were limited to going to other students for their participation or their feedback.
Specifically for the lectures participating in the four student module cases, the module's dissemination was voiced as being different to other modules. When compared to other modules, the documentation of a student's project often stops at progress journals, final PowerPoint pitch presentations, and mock-ups handed in. In three of the four student module cases, however, case movies were made that summarized the student's experience, and the one other case included a 20-minute radio interview on a local station. These extra elements of dissemination brought with them an extra layer of reflection. One lecturer suggested that documenting the student project in this way allowed for others to understand what they actually do and what they actually value in their discipline. Another lecturer added to that documenting through film allows the student and their process to be on display instead of only focusing on the end result. For workshop participants who said their students did have contact with clients or participants, in comparison to designing for one, the educator said that the contact their students had was minimal. One of the lead lecturers saw this proximity as a means for her students to critically reflect on their understanding of the participant group. What was effortless for the graphic design students, she said, had been very hard for the senior citizens that participated. And what was easy for the senior, senior citizens had been really hard for the graphic design students. This led to a give and take of skills that none of the students or participants ex expected, and nor did the lecturer expect. Being a designer is already about not knowing, one per workshop participant said, and so designing for one puts them in a position of not knowing until they shift into engaging deeply. Perhaps different to some of the other points of difference, both workshop participants as well as student module case lectures identified designing for one as requiring the ability for students and lecturers to work within limitations or restrictions. It asks a lot from students in terms of class organization, and it relies on students being flexible. Taking a module off campus complicates things for both students and lecturers, suggesting that this would be a roadblock in their own institutions. There were additional issues as well in terms of scheduling, module descriptions, and learning outcomes defined in institutional course documentation. In Teams, the workshop participants discussed these limitations. While one lecturer suggested getting her peers on board would be difficult to manage, another suggested that her department head would, could potentially be convinced. Several identified responsibility as being one of the key points of difference from students not having a predetermined participant to their having, in some cases, to cold call their participants, the educators found this a lot to place on the shoulders of students. However, one case lecturer suggested that placing more responsibility on the student actually caused students to have vested interests in re the results. Next to this, workshop participants suggested that students had expectations about coursework and that designing for one might not fit into their expectations about a, what a design module should be or what would be required of them. Though some lead lecturers found the challenge in some instances too complex for students or too multidimensional, they also suggested that this should be one of the directions that design education should go. Designers of the future must dare to try to be able to tackle wicked problems. Thus, design education should be a bit more ambitious. There were also differences found within the module itself, its setup and its execution. For module frequency, the fact that it ran every day for several weeks in some instances, compared to participant modules in which a course runs eight hours a week for five weeks. Participants suggested that students being given time to create relationships with participants during class time as being very distinct. The longevity of the one-to-one -one relationship was not something that they would come up with in their own courses. One participant described it as being daring simply because of the plentitude of things that could go wrong and the potential for unexpected issues to arise. These complexities were mirrored by lead lecturers in the cases. Off-campus projects one lecturer suggested could deal with wicked problems and complex social challenges, and projects on campus were more controlled and allowed for zooming in on certain skills. For the lecturers who had taught on the case modules, they too identified differences within the setup, suggesting that it required a lot of extra work in terms of setup and management, yet they suggested that because it was so different, it also allowed them to learn a lot as educators. The educators within these data sets also identified the application of design research methodology as a key point of difference. Although many asserted to teaching research methods within their own modules or within their own departments, some saw designing for one as a real application of research that allowed for a real opportunity for primary research. Another participant voiced distinction between the two by stating that they were limited to having students conduct interviews and create personas.
For those lead lecturers who had taught the module case studies, they identified Designing for One as an approach which required students to use new methods and put them into practice. In some cases, they suggested, the students didn't even know they were doing research. They just called them activities. In reality, however, they were responding as researchers and responding to the needs of the moment. Many of the participants identified the environment or module setting as being one of the most distinct differences between their own modules and those defined in the workshop. Some specifically pointed to the difference in the idea of classroom. At their schools, classes were held within a clinical setting, whereas others described the Designing for One module as being a real-world, non-studio-based module. Some participants found these real-world contexts lacked the formality of design research. Informal meeting in someone's home, for instance, was different or entirely new to them. Courses in their schools were concrete versus the multi-packed object learning experience of Designing for One. Designing for One created an actual immersion in context that allowed students to learn from the nature of the problem itself. Outcome was equally a topic that many highlighted, with most suggesting that providing open-ended outcomes, particularly for bachelor students, was unusual. Some even suggested that themes being discussed, such as healthcare or digital literacy, were perhaps too difficult for undergraduate students to deal with. This individualized approach meant that the lectures, too, had to be flexible, requiring them to be flexible enough to allow for non-traditional outcomes and be less rigid in their expectations and the use of the discipline within the student projects. One of the workshop participants contrasted the designing for one approach against what she called an old school way of thinking in which students would fashion portfolios that allow uh, employers to evaluate a graduate's worth. She saw the designing for one approach in terms of its process and the storytelling of the process and allowing students to pay attention to that as much as they pay attention to the end artifact. The fact that designing for one had elements of risk embedded in it was one of the key points of difference identified by the participants. One of the other participants reflected on whether or not this approach could be used within our own institution, but suggested it would face potential ethical board issues. This was not insurmountable, she said, but the planning of such a project would take a lot of time. Another element of riskiness was related to the lecture themselves. A module such as this requires a lecture that can steer and guide a project well, one that plans and manages for risk on the forehand. For one of the lead lecturers, the riskiness that she experienced in the project was rewarding. I got to a point of crisis, she said. My students was in crisis about how to solve a problem that we couldn't find a solution for. And I got to the point of crisis as a teacher where I didn't know how to solve the problem either. And we were right there together trying to solve the problem. And as an academic, to get back to that point where you're learning new material, how to create a better interaction, how to watch more closely what we are missing, how else can we frame the problem? That's academic gold. That is what it, it fills your soul. That is food for an academic who has been teaching for 15 years, a real learning experience, and brand new information. One of the workshop participants suggested that the process itself was risky, not in its execution, but because the processes that happen in it are not very visible. They are intangible qualities, thus motivating others to work in this way or to get buy-in from colleagues could potentially be difficult. The final point of difference that workshop participants identified to their own modules was the inclusion of organizations and guest speakers. They found that the inclusion of organizations added value to the Designing for One approach by contributing external feedback that supplemented the expertise of the lecturers and aided in time and project management challenges that might arise. For some of the workshop participants, they pitched the point of difference in terms of what function these external parties had. External partners are nearly always seen as a client when actually they reflected, clients are not always users. Although this research was initially looking to identify ways in which the designing for one approach was different to other design educational approaches, the resulting impact of these points of difference have an inherent quality of unexpectedness. This unknowing places the approach within a creativity framework developed by Garrow and Kumar that suggests that creativity is prompted by variables that move the design process away from the known and the routine into areas that are unfamiliar and unknown. Looking at their illustration as a model, Garrow and Kumar suggest that these elements, or what is later referred to as variables, could be harnessed. That is what these points of difference can be seen to be elements within design education or variables that possess a potential to shift the design space 
Purposefully adding variables to the existing design process, Gera and Kumar suggested, allows designers to produce solution where feasible solutions do not exist in the current solution space, or improve on solutions that are already found. Although this research did not focus specifically on creativity in terms of outcomes, it did look to uncover elements in the designing for one that were extending the design space. Working together, these points of difference become variables that act as instigators. They create new experiences for both lecturer and student. In conclusion, looking at contrasting version of these variables also highlights the potential issues that can arise with maintaining routine design educational practice. Across a student's university career, there's little variation of course module setup or even variation in terms of time frame. Although participatory methods may be taught, they are not necessarily practiced with authentic users. Outcomes set about in module briefs can be found to be predefined and leaving little room for exploration. What has been suggested through these findings then is that embedded within the designing for one approach are variables that are not only relevant within the context of designing for one as a means to extend the design space, but perhaps even individually, they are able to extend the design space and disrupt routine educational practice. It is not suggested that these variables are finite, nor do they offer a direct how-to suggestion for implementation or an immediate call to action. Instead, however, they are starting points for designers and educators to reflect on their own ways of working and how they can be adapted, how they can relate theory to practice. It is a call for reflection on the sort of experiences that design educators are offering their students and to challenge the closed loop nature of design education. Thank you for listening. If you are interested in de using Designing for One in the classroom or for research inquiries, please email me at the address shown.